Hi, I'm your host, Anand J. Sukadia, and this is the Limitless One Podcast. Join me on this journey as I interview the most inspirational souls who are tapping into their limitless blueprint on a mental, physical, and spiritual level to thrive in uncertain times. If you feel you are so much more than just this body, just this life, and want to tap into your limitless potential, you're in the right place. Here we go, Starseeds. Five years ago, Xander Fryer was stuck in a nine to five, single, lonely, bored, and lost. He was unfulfilled and unhappy and getting paid a quarter million dollars a year to stay that way. But after losing his best friend to suicide and struggling with depression for months, he knew something had to change. He quit his corporate job in his late 20s with no idea what he was going to do in only three months of living expenses in the bank. Fighting for his life, for time, and in honor of his fallen brother, he embarked on a new journey. Despite the harsh criticism of those around him, within three months, he replaced his former six-figure salary, and in a year, he built a seven-figure business from the ground up. Xander is now a best-selling author, internationally renowned speaker, and host of the iTunes top podcast, You Don't Learn in College, and is happily married to the woman of his dreams. He's been featured in Time, Forbes, Inc., and TEDx, and his company, High Impact Coaching, serves over 50,000 people in 27 different countries and at more than 700 organizations. He is praised as the next generation leader by Chicken Soup for the Soul author Jack Canfield and regarded as the coach of coaches by many top industry leaders like Craig Ballantyne and Bedros Koulian. So welcome, Xander, to the podcast, to the Limitless One podcast, dude. I'm so excited to have you on. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I had the pleasure and honor of meeting you during uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were at the Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation events, where we got to spend five to seven hours of day meditating and stepping outside of our comfort zones. So tell me, dude, like what possesses an entrepreneur to get out of their rhythm and go to a place where you're going to be completely out of your comfort zone and meditate five to seven hours? That's, that's a really good question. I would say, you know, one of the things that, that really kind of came to me, I've been, I've been in the entrepreneurial world for about five and a half, six years now and had the, you know, had the, uh, I guess, you know, just the luck and gratitude or whatever you want to call it of, uh, you know, building a very successful business in a short amount of time and, and having a lot of fun doing it and living a, a great life. You know, I look back to when I, when I first quit my job and the life that I'm lit living right now, I'm like, there's no way, there's no way that I could have predicted the life that I get to live right now. Um, but I look back at that and so much of it is actually because of my, my meditation practice, my spiritual journey that kind of led to this point, you know, so it's almost like a lot of people want to build businesses because they think it'll make them happier, more free and, and more connected and fulfilled and that sort of stuff. And the reality is if you work on being happier, more free and more fulfilled, then all of these things start to come afterwards. So, so for me, you know, doing stuff like the, the dispenser retreat is almost a precursor to all the other material things that, that come in life. Right. So it's not, to me, it's not necessarily taking a step away from everything. It's actually the foundation for everything else. That's a, that's a beautiful way to put it. And you know, all the, the most fulfilled people that I know, they have a, a, a practice where they do step outside of the 3D reality and they try to go to a yeah. place that's calm and centered, whether it's hiking, whether it's uh, meditating, whether it's prayer, there's so many different ways and avenues to do it. But um, that is a trait mm -hmm. of very successful and especially very, very fulfilled people. Um, so let me ask you a question. What does living a limitless life mean to you? <laughs> That's a, that's a really good question. I think for me, you know, it's just about being curious. Uh, really, it's just about being curious to, to seeing what's really out there and what's really possible. You know, when, when we talk about a limitless life, there's, there's so many aspects of your life that can be limitless from a, from a health standpoint, from a business standpoint, financial standpoint. Um, I think for me, what it really triggers for me is like when, you know, throughout the first 27 years of my life until I became an entrepreneur, I had all these preconceived notions and ideas of what, what could happen for me and what I could achieve in all those different areas. 
And, you know, shortly after starting to realize that that was none of that stuff was true, you start to just kind of wonder, well, what is possible? Like what could actually happen? And you start to just get curious and you start to see how far down the rabbit hole you can go. And you're like, when I first quit my job, you know, I thought, you know, I was like, wow, it would be, it would be amazing to build a, you know, I don't know, a, a multi six figure business, make, you know, 20K a month, 30K a month. And, you know, here we are sitting at, you know, 400,000 a month shooting for, for uh, eight figures in the next year or two. And it's like, you know, the, the limitations that we put on ourselves are, are amazing to see like what we can think is the limit of what we do. And so for me, it's all about curiosity. It's like, well, what if this wasn't true? What if I could just do more or do better or be happier or be healthier or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, just being curious about what's actually possible. Yeah. And how did you get to that place of just opening up the blinders of that, that limitation? <laughs> I think, you know, it also, it, it's like, you know, first steps first, right. Start, start with the baby steps. I think for me, I always kind of explain it like, uh, like, like playing a game of poker, right? Like in the beginning, in the beginning, you, you kind of, you, you play with, you know, the, the $1 chips, right? Like blackjack or poker, whatever you want to call it. You're playing with like the $1 chips because you're just kind of like testing the waters to see like what's possible. And you start to do a couple of things here and there that you're like, oh man, like I didn't know I could do that. And, and every time you do that, it's like you, you played a, you know, played around a poker with a $1 chip and you won that $1 back. Well, you start to go do that enough. And every one of these $1 chips is like a programming in your brain. It's like every time you win one of those, yeah, you're going to lose some. It's poker, right? Like you'll lose some of them, but you're also going to win a bunch more. And in the end, the universe, unlike Vegas, in the end, the universe is in your favor, right? So I'm going to win more than I lose. And the more that you play, you start to get really comfortable with like, oh, I think I think I'm actually winning more than I lose. Like maybe I should, instead of $1 chips, what if I, what if I play $2 chips? What if I play $5 chips and you start to grow your, your, you know, your pot of chips. Right. And that's why, you know, you get to a point eventually, like, you know, a lot of people ask me when I was 27 years old, I was, I was working at Cisco systems. I was making somewhere around a quarter of a million dollars a year, like 240 K a year. Um, I had a great job, you know, drove a BMW, flew around the country, had meetings with executives at like Disney, Sony, Verizon, NBC, all, like amazing job. And I quit cold turkey to do this entrepreneurial thing. And everybody was like, dude, that's the biggest risk in the world. Right. And I was like, not really, because at this point, I, I you know, throughout my life, I played so much of this game of quote unquote life poker and taken risks and, and just tested the waters so much. I was like, I was getting pretty clear that every time I played, I had a better chance of winning than losing. And so at that point, you know, now I'm, now I'm quitting my job. People think you're going kind of like all in. I was like, that's not really going all in. It's not like my life's at stake. It's not like I'm going to die by quitting my job. Right. So I'm not really going all in. I'm just playing with hundred dollar chips now instead of, you know, $1 chips in the beginning. So I think just like anything else, start small, build your way up, get comfortable with the game of poker, get comfortable betting, you know, $1 chips, then $2, $5, $10, 25 up to, up to a hundred. Um, but you just start to build that mentality. And it's like, you know, now I'll go invest a hundred thousand dollars into something, at, you know, thinking about it for a total of five minutes. Right. Because I know that based on my past track record and what I've seen, there's a higher probability chance of me making this thing successful than not. Yeah. And the one cool thing about that is it's, first of all, it's an attitude of not feeling like, you know, the fear of not being successful. It's almost like a gamification of life where yeah. you're excited each time. And, you know, sometimes, you know, it doesn't work out the way that you want it to, but you, you take it as a learning lesson and you move forward and you're winning more well, than you're losing. And you're, and I think you, you, you touched on something there. It's, it's not, it's not like I'm not afraid to lose. Of course I'm afraid to lose. I'm still human, right? Like until you and I are meditating next to each other and we like levitate off the ground, like we're human. We have egos. We have these fears. So they still come up. It's like, you, you talked about the gamification. It's like, yeah, you're going to, you know, if you go fight the big boss, you're going to lose every now and then, but you keep doing it because eventually you want to win. So, you know, for me, it's kind of the same thing. If it's not going to kill me, why not try? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you're teaching more and more people how to do that. So let's get into your background. Tell us a little bit yeah. about where you came from and how you got to this place of becoming a, you know, a very <laughs> successful entrepreneur. 
Yeah. So I kind of like I mentioned, I used to work for Cisco Systems. I was a systems architect there, design networks for Disney, NBC, Verizon, Sony, all these big companies, Facebook, LinkedIn. You know, Ken is mid-20s making way too much money. You know, I had, I had a standing meeting with the Disney CIO. Like it was a good life. And I, I I ran my own schedule. And you know, so for a lot of people, that's like, you know, the goal, right? And, you know, up to that point, I had everybody, you know, tell me like what, what would make you feel successful. And I had all the things that everybody said should make me feel successful. The job, the title, the, the car, I lived in Venice beach. Like I had everything and I didn't feel successful. I just felt kind of empty. And it's like, every time I got a raise or a promotion, it was like, yeah. And then the next week it was like, shit, I'm back to the same feeling of like, I just got to keep pushing and grinding for something I don't really believe in. You know? So I basically had a, had a conversation with one of my mentors and he asked me the question. It's actually the title of my TED talk that I gave. He asked me the question, Xander, what would you do if you couldn't fail? And that completely opened me up, right? So what would you do if you couldn't fail? And I said, honestly, since uh, I, I used to be an Air Force ROTC, so I was going to be an Air Force fighter pilot. Uh, my senior year, I got a DUI, so I got kicked out of the Air Force. I was like, I had the Top Gun Award at field training. I had my pilot slot. I was going to be a fighter pilot. So you talk about like, I'd played the game of life and, and lost and won a lot of different times and realized it didn't kill me. Right. And so I, I told him, I was like, you know, honestly, ever since I ever got kicked out of the air force, I've, you know, I've just wanted to lead and mentor and, and help people more. And at Cisco, I don't really get to do that. I lead the early in career network. So I'm like mentoring people in Cisco, but it's like 5% of my time. And he said, well, why don't you figure out how to do that full time? Like meet and lead and mentor and coach people. I was like, what do you mean? Like Tony Robbins or something? And, and he's like, well, I don't know. I've never done it, but why don't you go figure it out? I was like, well, I've got this amazing job at Cisco. I've got, uh, I've, you know, making great money. I'm on, on a fast track to become one of the youngest directors in, in recent history. Like, you know, I've, I've got all this money. And he's like, wow, just because there's a path laid out in front of you, does that mean you should follow it? And, and just because, you know, you're good at something, does that mean you should actually do it? And he goes, Xander, and my mentor at the time was a, a seven-figure health and wellness entrepreneur. And, and he said, Xander, do you know the difference between you and me? I said, well, you make a shit ton more money than I do. And he said, no, the difference between you and me is I'm actually living my dream. And ever since you got kicked out of the Air Force, you've just been dreaming one. And you're too scared to admit it. And I was, you know, I was, I was this 27 year old kid making amazing money, driving a BMW. And he just saw right and just called me out. And I remember him saying after that, he told me, he told me two things. He's like, Xander, number one, when you get to my age, you'll realize the one sort one resource you can never get back is your time. And number two, every moment is either on purpose or off purpose. And every moment off purpose is a moment wasted. And that was really the moment for me that I realized it didn't really matter what I did. I just needed to make sure that every decision I made from that moment forward was a purposeful decision. It was with intention. It was not from a place of fear. It was not just because somebody else told me to do it. It was very thought through and most of the time in the face of fear, right? It was the thing that actually went counter to the thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I marinated on that was like a Saturday night lubricated by a little bit of tequila conversation. And uh, that, I'm Sunday, sure that helped a little bit, the tequila. So certainly, <laughs> certainly you know helped. It. Certainly helped. So that Sunday, I literally, I, I didn't talk to anyone. I couldn't think about anything but that conversation. And that Monday morning, I, uh, I, I went back to work and I remember my like eight to, you know, my eight to 9 a.m. calls for Sony. And I just remember thinking, I'm never going to get this hour back. And then my nine to 10 a.m. calls, I'm thinking, I'm never going to get this hour back. And then 10 to 11, 11 to 12, by lunchtime, I'm just thinking, I'm never going to get that morning back. So I just called up my manager and I was like, Frank, I, I quit. I'm done. And basically just quit pretty much on the spot. Um, no idea what I was doing. No idea what direction I was going. No past history as an entrepreneur, no network, no nothing. Right. So quit on the spot and, uh, and basically uh, decided I needed to figure out how to become a, a coach and actually be paid to be a coach. So the, the first thing that I did at that point um, was hire a shit ton of mentorship because I've always been big on mentorship. That was, I think that was the big leg up that I had from the Air Force is the Air Force always taught you to like 
like never be without a mentor. So even after I got out of the Air Force, I had mentorship in different areas. And I would, I would pick people that I wanted to be like or had lives that I wanted to, wanted to be similar to. And I would have them mentor me either informally or formally. So as soon as I quit Cisco, I basically invested about $35,000 into different mentorship, coaching programs, masterminds, online trainings, everything that I possibly could. And everybody's always like, yeah, but Xander, you made so much in Cisco. So you probably had this stockpile of cash sitting around. So you could just, you could just throw it out, whatever. I'm like, you guys, like I'm a millennial. You think I really saved any money while I was working at Cisco? I guess the stupidest shit I've ever heard. I had, I had, I had about three months worth of living expenses saved up and I spent every dime of it in the first 30 days. And I started to put myself, started to rack up credit card debt uh, over the next couple of months. I put myself, I maxed out two credit cards, put myself in about $25,000 worth of debt. But, you know, having worked with, you know, a half dozen different mentors and programs and all of these things, uh, I learned enough to kind of open up the combination lock of what it really took to, to build a, a coaching business from the ground up. Uh, so that fourth month, I ended up making about $13,000 in, in clients. And then the next month it was like 17, then it was 24, 32, 40. And it just kind of went up from there. Ended up having our first, you know, as a, as a life coach, you know, generic kid quits corporate job to build life coaching business. Uh, you know, the only difference was like, I kind of figured out how to make money doing it. So we had our, our first six figure month within 12 months and basically had a lot of, a uh, lot of coaches that, that, we're out there, life coaches, health coaches, fitness coaches, career coaches, relationship, every type of coach that I'd been networking with. And they were just like, dude, you just did in like six months what I've been trying to do for six years. Like, what the hell did you do? So I like put together, I was an engineer, right? So uh, that engineering mind just goes, well, let me see if I can like put together the system of what I did and see if it works for you. So I put together the system and I started giving it to a handful of people and they got amazing results. So they told more people and that's kind of how high impact coaching was born. So uh, now to this point, you know, five years after that, uh, we've helped over 800 coaches build six figure, multiple six figure and seven figure coaching businesses. And really it's for me, it's just about replicating that result that I got because, you know, every coach that I get to help go full time, do what I did, break away from the matrix or the nine to five and uh, come from a place of service and help other people. Every coach that I get to help do that they're going to go help a thousand people or 10,000 people. So every one of those that I help, you know, if I help a thousand coaches and they go help another thousand people, well, that's a million people that I get to impact by, by having that, that, uh, that workload. So. Yeah. Incredible. And first of all, a couple of things, um, applause and props for having the difficult conversation. You know, it's not yeah. easy to do, but you're paying him for a reason. And if he's, you know, coaches and mentors, if they're not willing to really call their, their mentees out and do it with compassion and do it with love because they really care and are invested in their success. Yeah. That, that conversation changed your life. Obviously then you had to go through all the hard work that you did creating what you did, but um, that's the first thing. No, it was, it was super simple. It was super easy. It wasn't difficult at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Cause you, you created the system. So there you go. You laid it out. Yep. And then secondly, the, uh, the ROI, right? A lot of people are like, oh, that course is like a lot of money. I don't know if I could put, put out a thousand dollars or $2,000. Whenever I go to self-development self-develop, course, everyone's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're spending $15,000 on this. Or, I'm telling you the return on investment uh, from a fulfillment perspective, from a relationship perspective, communication perspective, business perspective, it pays itself over multiple times over. And these are skill sets yeah. you continue with the rest of your life. So uh, for people listening, you know, it's not, it's not a good thing to think short term and like, I don't have the money. It's like, how can I generate this money to invest in myself? So this way I have a long-term toolkit or tool, tool in my toolkit. I, I love that so much because it, so many people, I think part of it, you know, obviously my, my, my book and my podcast is shit you don't learn in college. And I think part of this thinking comes from, it, it comes from so many people that have invested tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars into their formal education of, of university degree or whatever it might be. And a lot of them don't see the fulfillment or the financial return that they're expecting, right? Like I know so many people that rack up college, you know, college debts, and then they go work in a job that they hate to barely make enough to make ends meet and then pay off that college debt over the course of the next five to 10 years, right? So in their mind, they're like, if I go invest in something, 
it's a sunk cost and it's going to take me to an unhappy place. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I think it's, it's so terrible because it scares so many people away from investing in something that would actually take them the right direction. I remember when I first quit my job, I thought about this. I was like, I was like, man, like, you know, I just finished off paying my, my college debts. Like, am I really ready to go into debt again? And I thought about, it, I was like, that's the stupidest idea I've ever had. Because yeah, I paid a hundred thousand dollars to get a degree from UCLA and you know work for Cisco and make money, but not be fulfilled. Why would I hesitate now that I'm clear on what I want to do? Why would I hesitate to spend more money and actually get the education that's going to take me the right direction, right? And so for me, it was a no brainer. But for so many people, I think they they think of it as a sunk cost, or they're not going to see the return, or like you mentioned like very short sighted, like, oh, this thousand bucks or 2000 or 5,000 or whatever it might be. Every single program or every single like self-development course or mastermind that I've been a part of has yielded a amazing ROI. Now I will tell you, it's not always the ROI that I thought. Mm -hmm. And it's not always, it doesn't always come back to you the way that you think. But like, if I were to go back every single program I've ever invested in, I would invest in again, including the ones that like during the time I was like, this is a shit program and it didn't, didn't work for me. I remember there was a mastermind when I first started, it was actually the first mastermind that put me into debt. So it was the first one that I had to put on a credit card. It was $12,000. And at this point I'm making $0 income. And I, I like, I don't know how I'm going to be making money in the next two to, I've, I've got like a 30, 40 day runway before I'm out of cash to pay rent. Right. And I invest $12,000 into this program. And I, I still remember it. I like, I'm starting to learn these like marketing systems and stuff like that. And they're super outdated. They're from like 2012. The, so all the systems were outdated. All the, like all the, the mentorship and, and coaching, like the support was horrendous. Right. But it actually taught me a couple of things and it, and it gave me something from that mastermind that I'll never forget because it probably made me millions of dollars in the future. Um, the first thing that happened was I learned who I didn't want to be as a coach. The second thing I learned was it, it gave me the opportunity to face my fears and keep going because that was the first one that I put myself into debt. And it was a terrible experience. I could have stopped there. Mm -hmm. Especially you know, I, the I was one. It's not like you had three that were successful. And then the fourth yeah. one, okay, let's keep going. But yeah. So, so it was the first one that put me into debt and I could have stopped there. I could have let my fears take over my programming go, Oh, this isn't going to work. I should go back to a nine to five. And instead I, I just said, no, I'm not going back. Like I have to face this and I have to move forward. You know, I always tell people when, when God or the, you know, mother earth or the universe or whatever you believe in, like when you ask for courage, does it give you courage or does it give you the opportunity to be courageous? Right. And I was given the opportunity to be courageous and face my fears and keep moving forward. And I, I would have never had that opportunity had I not done this. And the next two programs that I invested in like busted the door wide open, right? And had I not done that, I would have never had the opportunity to overcome my biggest fears to get to the success point. And then the third thing that I didn't realize until about a year later, through that mastermind, I got connected to a friend who then connected me to another friend who eventually connected me to my future mentor and one of my best friends, Craig Ballantyne, who has to this point probably made me two to $3 million. Wow. But had I not gone through that, you know, crappy mastermind, I would have had that connection that introduced me to somebody else that eventually got me to Craig that made me $3 million. Right. And I would have never seen that in the program, but I see it now. I'm like, Holy crap. I'm glad that I, I made that investment. So, you know, when it comes to investing in personal development or masterminds or anything like that, like the one thing that I have for anybody listening is like, get started now, get started sooner than you think and do more than you think is comfortable because you're going to see the return bigger and faster, the bigger you go. 100%. And the access to people like, right. So we, we invested in a meditation course, obviously it was worth every penny plus more, but the amount of access to people that we we're sitting at yeah. lunch with, we got to meet each other. I'm sure we're going to spend, you know, be friends, you know, in the future and hang out and do all these kind of cool things. I met hundreds of people that way. And it's just, um, it's one of the added benefits, but a lot of people don't realize it because it's not immediate. It's a, it's a long-term relationship that you build and, uh, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And so I think people, people forget how important your environments are to, to 
dictating everything in your life, right? So, you know, one of my, one of my good friends says your environments dictate your destiny, right? So putting yourself around other people that are doing what you want to do or accomplishing the things you want to accomplish, that's the, that's the fast track to success. If you put yourself around them, you're going to start to think like them. You're going to start to act like them. You're going to start to behave like them. And eventually you're going to become that person. So hundred percent brother. So let's get back to your business. High impact yeah. coaching, right? So a lot of people come to you, um, their coaches may be part-time and they want to transition into making it a full-time career. Let's talk about a yeah. little bit about the challenge. Cause I know a lot of people that want to do this, but they're having a hard time pulling that trigger. So tell us a little bit how about you work with uh, people like that. I mean, so uh, the first thing that I would say is I don't necessarily uh, suggest doing what I did. <laughs> it's not for everybody, right? So when we when we work with when we work with a coach, there's certain people, and we do, we do like a whole personality and behavioral assessment, so we can actually tell who are the people that are like Xander. Like if you throw them off the cliff, they'll build their wings on the way down. And then there's other people that if you throw them off the cliff, they're just going to fall to their death. Right. And we don't, we don't want that. So, you know, the first thing that I'd say is like, really know who you are as a person. I always suggest to people like take, take a, take accountability for who you are as a person. When you get put under pressure, do you freeze or do you take action? Like, do you, do you push forward or do you, do you lock up? Um, and for a lot of people, you may have developed the habit. These are all habits that are changeable, by the way. Um, you know, one thing that I, I tell to every single one of our clients is like, you know, that you really need to understand the growth mindset. We have people that come in and start working with us. They're like, Xander, I'm terrible with systems and I'm terrible with focus. And six months later, they're the most organized, focused person that you've ever met. And you, they're teaching the focus and organization training for, for other people. But like, uh, just know who you are. And if you're somebody who tends to freeze up, like, don't just quit your job and do what I did, right? Make sure you kind of build out a plan and you get working with, uh, specifically, obviously working with someone who has the recipe to do it, right? It's it, Tony Robbins says success leaves clues, right? Well, if you want to bake a cake, are you going to go try and bake a cake on your own? Or are you going to go get a recipe and, and learn how to bake the cake properly? So you get it right the first time, right? Now, obviously building a business is not as simple as baking a cake. So you're going to make mistakes along the way and you're going to have to fix them. But really, you know, if someone wants to go full time, the first thing that I suggest is take it, take a note for yourself, right. And really get to know who you are. And then depending on that, you can kind of build your runway. So, you know, we have a lot of our clients when they first start working with us, they'll quit their jobs and start making a full-time income within 30, 60 days. There's other clients of ours where we help them start making money part-time on the side because they want to generate a little bit of savings. Normally we tell people like, if you were to cut down your expenses and just like live off of your savings for let's call it six months, right? How much would you need per month just to make it by so that you have a six month safety net before you quit your job and go full-time. So that's really helpful for people that tend to freeze a little bit more if they have, we call it a money trampoline, not really a safety net. I don't like the term safety net. I don't like people like going backwards. I like people jumping forward with it, right? So, you know, we have some people that are like, no, I'm like Xander, like just put me under fire. Let's go. Like I've got one month of living expenses saved up. And it's because they, you know, that whole terminology of like burn the boats, like they get on the island, they burn the boats and they just take off. Right. And then there's other people that do it part time. Maybe they build up to 5K a month, 8K a month, 10K, 15K a month. Normally, we like by the time someone hits 10K a month, if you're not quitting your job, like, and that's on the side, like you're an idiot. Right. Um, because at that point, if you quit your nine to five, what are you going to make once you're fully in the business? So, you know, it really comes down to like really knowing who you are, whether or not you want to build uh, part time and then quit your job once you get to a certain point. Or if you want to jump ship and go for it full-time right away, obviously jumping ship and going for it full-time right away, you're going to get there faster. There's, there's no way around it. Doing it part-time, you have to understand that like building a business on the side of something else is always going to be more difficult than building the business itself, right? So there's a Russian proverb that says, if you chase two rabbits, you'll catch neither one, right? So you can only do that for so long. So the next piece of advice I give anybody that they're building it uh, part-time on the side is you have to give yourself a timeline to quit. Like if you're serious about going full-time, it can never be, it can never be, Oh, once I get to X, Y, Z, I'll quit. It'll be nine months from now I'm quitting. And that's the timeline. And I have, I have nine months to build as much of a runway, to build as much of a savings or six months to build as much of a runway and as much of a savings as possible. And then I'm quitting. 
Um, and it's this, it's this mental switch when people finally make the mental switch to, oh my God, like I'm fully committed. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Joe talks about it. It's this, when you make a decision in a very powerfully emotional way, it echoes in the, in the quantum field, in the spiritual realm, whatever you want to refer to it as. And that decision is what starts to bring to you that, that next reality. Most people never fully make the decision that they're really going to do it a hundred percent. And then, you know, so it's, you have to make the decision that it's happening at some point and set that date. And uh, the next piece is very, very simple. Get mentorship, like get help. Like I mentioned it earlier. I'll mention it over and over again. And look, everybody's like, oh, well, you're a coach. Of course, you're going to say that because you want people to come work with you. I'm like, I don't care if you work with us or other people. I don't give a shit. I have way too much money. I, I help a lot of people. I love what I do, but I don't care if you work with us or somebody else. Like you have to get mentorship. There's, there's no argument for not getting mentorship. And I hear way too many people saying, oh, but I'll figure it out on my own. And then I'll get, or, you know, once, once I get clarity around where I need to go, then I'll get mentorship. I'm like, well, the reason you don't have clarity is because you don't have mentorship. You can't read the label from inside the bottle. Once I get making X, Y, Z amount of dollars, then I'll get mentorship because I can afford it. You're not going to get there because you need the mentorship to learn how to get there. Right. So people have this idea that mentorship comes second and mentorship comes first. Like you have to get the, the mentorship because the truth is, if you were already the person that you needed to be to be successful, you'd have it. You'd be there, but you're not. So you have to start to ask yourself, well, why not? And there's things that you know you don't know. And there's a lot of that you don't even know that you don't know. And you're never going to learn what that stuff is unless you get somebody else looking at you and telling you what you're doing wrong. So like this is, I've had mentorship for the last five years. I, I will always have multiple coaches, multiple masterminds that I'm a part of getting multiple people's eyes on my blind spots. Because of, like you mentioned, the, the return that I get, I've spent over a half million dollars over the last five years on my own mentorship, just to give you guys an idea of how important I, I view this. A half of a million dollars just on coaching and personal development and mentorship. To, to keep me moving forward. And people wonder why my business keeps you know doubling every single year. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because I invest in mentorship every single year. Incredible. And commitment, success takes commitment. And I've never met sure. a trapeze artist that's successful by standing on the platform. Yeah. You got to jump. You got to jump at to, some point. You have to let go as well. So it's taking yeah. that first step and then trusting in the uncertainty and knowing that you're going to catch the other bar and land on the other side's and so and that's it's a little bit rocky, but you're going to get there, but you have to let. Yeah. And that, I think, you, that, you know, using this trapeze analogy is a really good point because so many people, like if you've got a net below you on a trapeze, you're not going to die, right? Or you've got that zip line on you. You're not going to die, but it's still scary, mm -hmm. right? Like your heart's still pounding. Your, your physiology still thinks you're about to be eaten by a saber tooth tiger. It's freaking out, right? You're in complete fight or flight mode. So it's still scary. But the truth is you're not going to die. So at some point you have to develop the strength of will and consciousness to say, you know, thank you, all the fears that are going on right now, but I'm not going to dictate my life based on fear. Yeah. I'm going to dictate my life consciously knowing that if I jump right now, I'm not going to die, even if I miss this bar. So I'm going to jump because what's the upside? Well, if I jump and I catch that bar, what if I start to live the life that I truly want to live? have the impact I want to have, save the lives I want to save, get to donate to all the causes that I want to donate to, finally have that house that I want to live in with the, the husband or the wife that, that is you know, an amazing person, right? At some point, you have to decide if you're going to jump to grab that bar or not. And if you never jump because you're too afraid of dying, you're never going to get it. Absolutely, brother. And you talk a lot about you are in the business of saving the world. So yeah, one coach at a time. So tell us what that means to you. <laughs> You know, my, I truly believe that if more people in the world, and this is exactly what we're talking about right now, if more people in the world acted from a place of purpose or love or growth and less from fear, we would actually solve all of this world's problems. I truly believe that. And for me, it's, it's just about helping people realize what their, what their programmings are, where their fears are coming from and why they're happening that are preventing them from doing the things that actually lead to a more purposeful, fulfilling life. You know, most people don't realize this, but 90% of the decisions that you make actually come from a place of fear. Maybe not you, you're a conscious guy, right? But most people, 90% of the decisions we make come from a place of fear, right? Now, back when we were, you know, back when we were ancient or, or evolutionary man, right? 
it makes sense, right? We have, we actually have shit to be afraid of saber tooth tigers, short nosed bears, not getting enough food and dying. Right. When you're first born, you have two, uh, innate fears. Do you know what they are? Is it, uh, drowning? Nope. No. It's loud noises and heights. Which makes sense because as a baby, you don't want to, we're talking about trapeze. You don't want your baby just walking off the edge of a cliff and you hear a loud noise as evolutionary man. Well, it's probably a tiger or a bear or something. You should probably go the other direction. Don't walk towards the short nosed bear, right? Every other fear that we have as humans is self-created or socially created. Every other fear, fear is self-created or socially created. And those fears create subconscious programmings. 95% of our brain is our subconscious. That 95% of our brain dictates majority of our thoughts, actions, and habits throughout our life. So most people just run their life based on fears that were created from earlier in their lives that don't mean anything, right? And so their future ends up just becoming more of the same of the past, unfulfilled, unhappy, without the money they want, without the impact they want. And then it's the people that start to choose purpose. A lot of people think that purpose is an end game. It's not. It's a decision that you make in every moment of every day, right? Are you choosing purposefully or are you choosing from a place of fear? It's a pretty simple question to ask yourself. And if, in my opinion, if more people to start to choose purpose and less people would choose fear, we actually have a shot at solving some of these world's problems. And that's really what, what high impact coaching and our mission is all about, because you know, if I can help every coach, every coach wants to serve others, whether they're health coaches or life coaches or career coaches, they want to help others. But what's the biggest thing that stops them from being successful in business? It's their own fears. It's their own fears and, and, and fear of judgment, fear of criticism, right? They, they, sit around, they sit around like fumbling about the color of their logo or the, you know, their website rather than doing the one thing that actually matters, getting yourself out there and going and helping people right? You're, you're worried about how you look to the world rather than just like letting that go and getting out there and serving the others that need you. There's, there's hundreds of people out there right now that are crying themselves to sleep with the problem that you solve. And you're worried about getting on a sales call and appearing salesy. Well, whose fault is that? That's you. That's your own limiting beliefs. That's your own fears. So, so many of these coaches, you know, they, they have all these limiting beliefs and fears of their own that are preventing them from getting out there and serving others. And, you know, in my opinion, if we could help a thousand, 10,000 coaches, like I mentioned, if we can help 10,000 coaches go full-time, overcome themselves, learn how to market properly, learn how to sell properly, learn how to develop their niche and their offer. So they have clients coming to them and then learn how to get out of their own way. And every single one of those coaches goes and helps 10,000 more people. Well, that's a, that's a hundred million people that we can help. That's, you know, more than 1% of the population that is now living more purposefully, more from a place of love and growth and intention and less from a place of fear. You get, you get 1% of the world. There's a whole study that was done. It's called percent project. There's a whole study that was done. If you get 1% of the world to shift their consciousness, you have, you have an exponential uh, evolutionary consciousness growth within the population as a whole. So that's my goal. Are you talking about the Maharishi effect? Is that what? Probably. I don't know if it's the Maharishi effect. I know there was a study that was done on it though. Yeah. Amazing. Now the, the coaches that come to you, do, uh, do you specify any specific niches or um, do coaches come to you like literally from day one, they have no clients and then you help them build? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, we'll have people that are in specific niches, but uh, like a lot of people just come to us basically where I, I'm doing now what I wish I had when I first started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I knew I wanted to be a coach. I knew I wanted to serve others. I, I, I just needed some, some help in the direction and the, the recipe to make it happen. And at that point, nobody had had the recipe. Everybody told me, you know, Xander, it's going to take you a year or two years to build a full-time business. And I just refused to believe that was the truth. So I went and learned all the different marketing and all the different online tactics and all the different sales strategies. And I, I picked and, and prodded what I thought would work best. And then I took from my experience at Cisco and I combined it all together to basically help me get a six figure business up and running in less than four months. And so we're basically teaching that to, to, you know, any coach, whether you're a life coach, health coach, whatever, because most, you know, pretty much like 98% of people we work with, they think they have a niche, they think they have an offer and they don't.
you know, the thing that I tell people is there's a difference between having an offer and having an offer that people will actually buy from you and you can actually impact the world with, right? And majority of coaches, you know, think, oh, I have a lead generation problem or I have a sales problem. The truth is they just have a shitty offer and they haven't gotten clear on an offer that actually works. Oh, and then they have to learn lead generation and sales on top of that. But, you know, the offer is the, the starting point. I honestly think 98% of people we work with, even the ones that, you know, they have a, a part-time business, you know, they're earning 2K, 3K, 5K per month. You know, most people don't have a solid niche and offer. People are just hiring them because they, they you know, they're, they're inspired by that person, so, but they don't have anything scalable really. Yeah, definitely. And I, also the other side of it, I know people with amazing content and they're charging such little amount of money for it. Yeah. And it's almost because of the subconscious beliefs of <laughs> having that imposter syndrome, like, oh, I'm not good enough. Only the, you know, you know, people will like kind of like figure me out. So I'm maybe only charge like $50 for my, you know, $1,000 yeah. program. Yeah. And we see that all the time. And here's, this is, this is a very controversial opinion, but I, like I've been in the space now for six years and I've never seen anything disprove this people who pay, pay attention, period. End of statement, right? People who pay, pay attention. So like, when we work with clients, we teach them how to charge what we call high ticket or premium prices. So anything from 3K to 25K for your programs. And what we found is anybody charging, really charging anything less than that, five, you know, 50 bucks, a couple hundred bucks, whatever it might be, they end up with a lot of tire kickers, a lot of people that they have to chase down to come to sessions. People don't do homework. They don't do, they don't get results. We get so many people that have big audiences, just like you mentioned, and they're charging peanuts. And yeah, they might sell a bunch of them if they have a really big audience, but how many people complete that program yeah. on average, if you're doing like something like that, like dude, it's, it's something like 91% won't complete the program. Not to mention like of the 9% who complete it, how many actually get results, right? Because there's like, how many, uh, like how many online programs have you bought that you just didn't go through? I, I, yeah, I could count so dozens, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's the ones that I pay a bunch of money for that I show up and I give the energy and I get the results from. Um, you know, so we, we tell this to everybody because a lot of people think, oh, if I charge less, I'll get to more people. And they quickly find out it's just as hard to sell a hundred dollar program as it is to sell a $3,000 program. I'm not kidding you. We had, we had one of our clients who was in the health and wellness space. She had a $97 course. She was trying to sell for six months. She sold five, five of them. We took that same exact course and we, we shifted the delivery a little bit to include some coaching and make sure she was getting great results. And then we taught her how to sell that same program for $5,000 over the next two months. Guess how many she sold? Five, like same program, but 5,000 instead of 100. And she say, sold the same number. So people don't realize it's just as hard to sell something for a hundred bucks as it is to sell it for 5,000 bucks. If you know how to sell. Right. So why, why would you not go for 5,000 so that you now have extra money? Right. And it's not like, like, let's say you start making a bunch of extra money. Everybody's like, oh, that's greedy. Well, yeah. If you're just buying Rolexes and diamond, you know, necklaces and, uh, and Ferraris and, but for majority of us, majority of coaches, we take that money and we put it back into the business so that we can get to more people. Right. If you had extra cash and you could then go afford to hire a VA or an extra coach to support you or somebody to help you with social media or start paying for advertising, it's just going to get you to more people. So that extra cash you get just furthers your impact. Yeah. And think about the amount of time and effort and energy life force that you put into something. The difference between making $2,500 a month and $25,000 a month, imagine the, just like how it feels, like you work that hard to only make $2,500, it doesn't put a good energy into the business, then yeah. you start regretting, you start having resent for the business, and then People you're start to resent the business, they start to resent what was once their passion, mm -hmm. because it turns into a grind, so most people end up quitting. Beautiful. So how does the coach of coaches, like you, get coached? Oh, uh, how does the coach of coaches get coached? Uh, I would say a lot. I have a, uh, nutrition and, and, uh, workout coach, like a PT that does my nutrition and workouts. I have a coach that has helped me and Maddie in our relationships. I have a coach that helps me. I have probably three different coaches that help me in my business from, you know, one from just the pure, uh, leadership and running a team. Another one that does helps me with sales and marketing. And another one that just helps me personally as a, as a uh, person. 
So how do I get coached? The answer is every way in every angle possible, because I've seen, like you mentioned, I've seen the return uh, on my life, on my relationships, on my business come back tenfold in every different area. So it's like, you know, if, if there's ever anything that I have, uh, I'm not where I want to be. I, I go find coaching and I'm, I make sure that every time I show up, I show up like a 10 year old kid, curious, ready to learn, ready for more. Beautiful. And you mentioned your lovely wife, Maddie. Tell us a yeah. story about how you guys met. Cause I got to hear it at lunch and I want the audience <laughs> to, to hear this. Sure. Um, I know we, I know we're under a little bit of a time crunch, so I'll yeah. keep it short, but, um, yeah, th this actually came from coaching. So, uh, I had a business mentor, Craig, who we actually men mentioned earlier. And uh, I went to one of his workshops back in 2017. This was when my business was really starting to take off. And, uh, we set some goals for 2017 for where I wanted the business to go. And he had me set some personal goals too. And one of my, one of my personal goals was, uh, meeting an amazing woman. I had been single for about five years at that point. And, uh, and so end of the year is coming up and I'm doing some accountability with Craig. And I mentioned, I just been to like three weddings in three weeks and, and a couple of bachelor parties. And it was so cool to see my friends getting married and falling in love. And Craig sends me an email back. He says, well, you're supposed to meet the woman of your dreams by the end of this year. Like, what are you doing for that? And I said, well, nothing. I haven't been going on any dates. I haven't been doing anything. So he said, he sent me two words back. He said, public accountability. So I took that. And I went into my Facebook group of at the time was like 2,500 or 3,000 people in it. Uh, this is a business coaching group, by the way, remember that. And so I go into this business coaching group and I do a Facebook live titled Help Me Find Love. And, uh, you know, it's I do this whole thing about how, you know, I said I was going to meet an amazing woman by the end of 2017. It's now November. So I have 60 days to meet the woman of my dreams or I'll do whatever weird shit everybody in here can come up with. And I got droves of comments like shave your head, donate your car, dance on third street promenade naked, fly me to Mexico, all this stuff. And, uh, and then I had, a, this is a group of coaches. So I also had a bunch of coaches that were like, Xander, you can't force love. You got to work on yourself. <laughs> like, and I'm like, Oh my God, don't reflect your bullshit on me. I've been working on myself for five years. I need to do something about it. So after that, I ended up having a lot of people reach out to me like, Hey, I want to introduce you to my, my cousin or my best friend or uh, my sister or my daughter, like stuff like that. Went on a few dates, nothing really came from it. And then this amazing, uh, Australian reached out to me. A uh, beautiful Australian reached out to me and said, hey, I don't know what could come from this because I live in Brisbane. We live halfway across the world from each other, uh, but I find you and your energy really attractive and I just love to connect. And so we did a Zoom call. I fell in love with her accent instantly. I was still a little bit confused how we could make the, the long distance thing work, but we set up a second date and uh, the way Maddie tells it, uh, she says that I stood her up. Uh, I, I don't remember it going that way. I, but I'm sure she's right because she's got to be the time thing, right? You it's got to be the time thing. No, I, 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 something broke in the business and I completely lapsed. It was entirely my fault. And I, I missed our second date and she reached back out to me and she said, look, you know, whatever it was, not a big deal, but I don't think anything's going to come from this unless we meet in person. And she said, I'm flying out to my dad's in Dubai over the holiday if I stop by in San Diego on the way, would you want to meet? Because Dubai and San Diego are right next to each other. I don't know if you know. Yeah. But of course, being, being a guy, I'm like, hell yeah, that sounds great. Come on over to San Diego. So she ends up flying out to San Diego, uh, December 29th, 2017, two days before the end of the year. And we end up falling in love. I don't know how else to explain it. We end up falling in love. She was supposed to stay for three days. She ended up staying for a week. After that, we dated long distance for the next 10 months. We went back and forth between Australia and the US, uh, maybe 12 times during those 10 months before we finally moved out to the US and uh, got married two years ago. And we've been happily married ever since. Uh, Going to start working on our first child this year, but it all came back to coaching, came back to a coach pointing out something that I was doing that was going against the goals that I had and getting me to do that uncomfortable thing that changed my life. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, that is how the universe works. You put yourself out there and watch the miracles fucking flow into your life. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, final question. Why do you think you came here to planet Earth, this beautiful place as Xander Fryer? What did you want to experience? 
Oh, great. Those are two different questions, I think. Why did I come to Earth? I, I came to Earth to empower and inspire others to, to live that true version of themselves, to live purposefully. That's why I came to Earth. It's, it's actually not about me, I don't think. But I love the follow-up to that is what did I want to experience? I think, you know, for me, I, I'd say I wanted to experience probably the true depth of love that, that you can experience here on Earth. And, and I've had a lot of loss. Uh, I, you know, my best friend took his own life. I've, I've had relatives lose their lives. I've, I've experienced a lot of loss in, in my life. And I think because of that, I've, I've also experienced more love than I could have ever imagined. And, and, and we're talking love with my partner, with Maddie, love for my clients, love for myself and, and the mission that we have. You know, I've, I've never experienced so much love and joy. And I think that's why, why you know, what I wanted to experience this, this time around in this life, at least. Beautiful, man. And uh, I only know you for two weeks, but I, I love you, dude. <laughs> I love you too, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you. I'm inspired by you and I'm humbled that you could join us today. Thanks for having me, brother.